game. Hello, all. Good morning. I'm feeling rather fragile today. Yes, it's the little things that matter. I love shopping. And Monday's always my catalogue day, sorting everyone out. It's not just the big things that are important. It's making sure you get enough paper clips and tip eggs and such like. Now that's efficiency. I'll just see what I need. <coughs> this filters out harmful radiation and the chair is adjustable to prevent RSE, repetitive strain injury. These aren't luxuries, they're absolutely vital for efficiency and happiness. Finally, in any healthy building, you'd be able to open the window and let in real fresh air. Above all, clients respect status. They like to know they're dealing with the top man. <laughs> I have room to swim a cat here. It's pathetic. Basically, people are the problem. Look, machines are loyal servants. Quiet, efficient, streamlined. No rows, no muddles, no long tea breaks. Am I asking too much? There is no consensus about how an office should be organised, but you never guess it from the confident, assertive facade of a modern office building. While researching why the office machines in this series had become so successful, I became increasingly intrigued how offices themselves had achieved such enormous scale and affluence, funding wonderful extravagances like this voluptuous Venus. It's not obvious, though, what all these offices are actually doing. Despite my researches, this still baffles me, but I did discover that the history and evolution of the office is a curiously quite fascinating subject. 150 years ago, there were no office blocks, and the only office workers were Dickensian clerks. They wrote letters and financial ledgers, but all other business was conducted by word of mouth. There were no memos, reports, printed forms and orders. Yeah, I'll go right along there now. Yeah, but uh, how about the 1042? Recent research in America suggests that the introduction of printed forms stemmed from a series of fatal train crashes in the 1840s. The forms, initially introduced to increase safety, soon spread to every aspect of the railway company's business. This was a period of rapid expansion in America and many other companies adopted the formal procedures pioneered by the railways. New technology, the typewriter, the telephone and the filing cabinet, surprisingly not introduced till 1892, were introduced to cope with all the new paperwork, putting America firmly in the lead of office practice. A vast new workforce was also needed. In contrast to the Dickensian clerks, the new office employees worked under a bureaucratic hierarchy. They were generally tied to their desks, ploughing through the mountain of paper. They weren't usually even allowed to talk during working hours. Some of the most influential ideas about organising it all came from a steel foundry engineer called Frederick Winslow Taylor. In 1900, Taylor had discovered that adding minute amounts of tungsten and chromium to steel made it much harder. The cutting tools made of his steel could cut metal five times faster than had previously been possible. Taylor's high-speed steel has been used for drill bits ever since. Taylor then concluded, though, that the most inefficient part of drilling and practically any other process was not the materials or the tools, but the person doing it, the worker. <sighs> Taylor was convinced there was one best way for every job. Yeah, you might be working a lot faster than this. Oh. Into my eyes and work yeah. twice as fast. After training one worker to treble the amount of pig iron he could load in a day, Taylor was forced to abandon his experiment. Hey, off with you. How dare you teach us our job? His time and motions techniques remained unpopular, 
but his writings on the subject became very influential. Lenin and Hitler were among his fans. My theory of work is that there is no limit to which the human body cannot be pushed as long as the leader has a moustache. Some scientific management disciples applied Taylor's ideas to offices, struggling to organise the mountain of paperwork. James Bunker Gilbreth made extensive use of photography. These are some of his original films. He even repeated Taylor's experiment with the pig iron. Gilbreth believed in analysing every movement to find the one best way. Here a champion typist is being trained, particularly to keep her eyes on the copy, not on the keys. One of his favourite techniques was to tie light bulbs to his subjects. I can show you his technique with this camera. If I set it on a long exposure, I can, for instance, uh, collate or put together a number of bits of paper. The lights are tracing the, exposing the films and tracing the movements of my hands. Gilbreth then showed the final picture to the employee to show how much wasted motion was involved. The technique became quite fashionable and was widely used. Some scientific management disciples were more extreme. A Mr Leffingwell published photographs of the contents of office waste paper baskets. On the subject of pencil management, Mr. Leffingwell recommended the issue of these metal extenders so that the pencil could be used right down to the end. The stub was then to be presented to a supervisor before issue of a replacement. Leffingwell also recommended spot checks to ensure that uh, employees could lay their hands on less frequently used bits of stationery without any delay. The strict regimes imposed by scientific management certainly contributed to making an office worker's life pretty wretched. Follow the crowd, get the big money. You make a pile and raise a pile, that makes another pile for you. Follow the crowd, we've reached a million, two million, five million. Watch us grow, going up. It's new, it's automatic, it dictates, records, seals, sterilizes, stamps and delivers in one operation without human hand. What am I bid? What am I offered? Sold. Who's next? The people, yes. Follow the crowd to the Empire City, the Wonder City, the Windy City, the Fashion City. The people, yes. The people, perhaps. Things started to change in the late 20s after a scientific management study on some girls assembling electrical components. Finding no improvement in raising lighting levels, a Mr Elton Mayo tried consulting the workers. How would you like your tea breaks? How long? When? Tell me. Well, Mr. Mayo, we think three 20-minute tea breaks would suit us a whole lot better. Now, where's progress? Yeah, they're working faster. Bye, Bye Mr. Mayo. However, when the girls returned to their normal hours at the end of the experiment, their output broke all records. Must be because I took notice of the poor critters. These experiments founded the human relations approach to office management. Staff were encouraged to feel more involved, amongst other things, by the introduction of company leisure facilities. Rest rooms, where the girls can spend their time off duty, are also provided. For the more energetic members of the staff, there is a gymnasium with a qualified instructor. human relations approach, liberalising working conditions, coincided with the growing emancipation of women, even if men were reluctant to recognise it. What is that whipcord resilience that lets the weaker sex play half the night, then bob up clear-eyed, ready for the next morning's work? This frail creature strikes her typewriter keys about 40,000 times a day. 
shifts to capitals and returns the carriage more than a thousand times each. Altogether, a few ounces at a time, she exerts more than five tons of pressure on her dainty fingertips in one day's work. And any way you look at it, women's work is not for sissies. The human relations approach to office management, encouraging everyone to use their initiative, didn't necessarily make the office more efficient. I guess just about every office has someone like Betty. A little short on personality, maybe, but darned efficient. Fact is, many of the procedures and filing systems were set up by Betty in the first place. Oh, Betty, do you have a minute? What is it, Joan? Well, I'm having an awful time checking anything in these guarantee files. It's all alphabetical, and there are millions of them. It takes forever to find any particular one. Well, we haven't been having any trouble. Well, the way they did it at Malco, Betty, saved a lot of time. There, we broke the guarantees down by cities. And then alphabetically. That way, when you wanted to check one, you could do it in a jiffy. Seems we could save a lot of time if we do it that way here. But, Mr. Barnes, she's changed the whole file around. I spent an hour looking for just one report. She's tearing down everything I spent years to build up. I just didn't expect such resistance to new ideas. Realizing that the human relations approach focusing on the psychology of office behavior was a rather unpredictable business, many office experts returned to more practical ways of improving efficiency. Just as the scientific management disciples had suggested, surely efficiency must go down if the environment is uncomfortably hot or cold or humid or drafty. Today, it's taken for granted that uh, all offices are fitted with air conditioning. The air comes out through slots in the ceiling, circulates round the office, and then goes back up again. The invention, though, that really made this a practical proposition and also radically changed the appearance of the office was the suspended ceiling. This conceals all the air conditioning ducting, uh, the sprinkler system, uh, the lighting, and uh, acoustic tiles to keep the noise levels down. Its origins are obscure, but by 1950, there was a complete kit of parts to suspend everything by these threaded rods. Air conditioning might never have caught on in a temperate country like Britain, except that developers realised that it could be economically rather attractive. Previously, offices had had to be designed in complicated, irregular shapes so that no desk was too far from a window, both for air and light. With air conditioning, developers for the first time could design deep space. So buildings could be put up in simple rectangular blocks that were cheaper to build and provided more area to let. This sort of new look office was presented as being glamorous and efficient. Those who dream in design are always contributing to our ways of work. Working situations benefit from a new kind of layout, bright, open, and inviting. The modern designer creates beauty through simplicity, bringing to active business a look of casualness, a look of luxury, combining to create a new look to American efficiency. German designers went further. In the 50s reaction against fascism, the Schnell brothers, who ran an office furniture business, started proposing bureau landschaft, or office landscaping. The office was to be fully carpeted, a revolution in itself, with desks arranged randomly to break down traditional office hierarchy. And what we need now is some plants. Some plants, some trees, perhaps. Mm. And we have bureau landschafts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At Beecham House, the flora and fauna mix freely in the atmosphere of an English garden. Typists type. Executives do whatever executives do. And everyone's more than happy. What better setting for an English rose? Perhaps some enterprising gardener will develop a new flower to mark this breakthrough. He could call it uh, Floribunda Secretaria. Despite all these changes in the appearance of the office, its efficiency still left much to be desired. The swinging 60s accelerated the liberalisation of office regimes, 
creating new distractions. What makes the ideal shorthand typist? Presentable, but not so glamorous that the big executive's mind goes round like a satellite. Nor yet so plain that he envies his colleagues who are away with Asian flu. You, sir, in the audience, are you an executive? If so, have you ever wondered why your ears burn in the girls' tea break? Mr. Keynes is the best boss I ever had. I wish they were all like him. All I can say, I'm sorry for his wife. Some companies reputedly started adding bromide tablets to the water to suppress their employees' libido. Meanwhile, the office organisation experts had started to put their faith in systems, analysing things like uh, communication and uh, decision-making. On a practical level, though, they noted that the uh, basic office equipment, the filing cabinet, the typewriter and the telephone, had remained basically unchanged since 1900. By 1970, whereas each factory worker operated an average £12,000 worth of plant and machinery, each office worker only had an average £1,000 worth of equipment. The key to improving office efficiency, many experts decided, was automation. Jan? Well, Dennis, I sure am thankful for new technology. With this equipment, I can do just about anything with a few simple commands. My work area is organized, allowing me to move about freely. And to top it off, I can be comfortable all day, thanks to proper lighting and temperature. We sure have come a long way. Thank you, Jan. To most people, this would appear to be an ultra-modern office, working with sophisticated, up-to-date equipment. But we now realize that this type of office is just an old-fashioned system dressed up with new hardware. We know that it's rapidly becoming obsolete. It was felt that until all the new machines were linked together, with all the information processed electronically, efficiency couldn't improve. We're in a race to keep up with the machines, and we're losing. The new office. Just imagine, an office with no stacks and files of paper. It's not futuristic, and it's not far away. Now, changes like this can be difficult. But they're also pretty exciting. And we're all going to be a part of it as the new office evolves. That video was made 14 years ago. And in many ways, this is the office of the future. These cool white surroundings where everything looks efficient and nothing is dirty. Every element carefully designed. The scientific management disciples would feel proud to see it. Their dreams come true. They would have approved of information technology, with all the information formally and logically entered into networks of computers. The new office buildings have lighting that doesn't reflect in the computer screens, extra cooling to remove the computer's heat, and false floors to conceal the wires connecting them together. These quite simple requirements persuaded many companies that their offices were obsolete, resulting in the lavish office building boom of the 80s. However, creating elegant palatial effects like these is enormously expensive and complicated. In addition to the control room, there's an entire hidden floor full of machinery. In here, there are vast cold water tanks, half a million gallons in here, and another million at the back there for the sprinkler system. And there are all the pipes for the air conditioning system, a uh, sort of workshop. And uh, next, this is where the electricity comes into the building, the switchgear room. Separate water tank and heater for the restaurant water, water softener over there, pumps for the cold water. It's all rather like a ship, really. Dispensers to add chemicals to the air conditioning water over there. Series of pumps for the hot water for the radiators. Large pumps for the air conditioning water there. This tank pressurizes some of the hot water. The boilers themselves are over there. This is the boiler control panel. Even the roof is quite busy with uh, control panels for some of the air conditioning, ducts and fans to suck air into the building, and other ones to take the stale air out. Then there are temperature sensors and uh, other weather detectors. Emergency extractor fans to suck smoke out of the atrium in case of fire and a whole battery of machinery over here for the air conditioning system. Pumps in there, 
cooling towers here, all enclosed now to stop the Legionnaires bugs getting out, and uh, a series of water chillers over here to keep the computer rooms especially cold. Simply keeping the building maintained needs a small army of people. However, even if all this expense is justified, the value of the information technology itself is unproven. In the last 20 years, the number of office workers has almost trebled. However, research has failed to find any significant increases in office productivity, perhaps because it's almost impossible to measure. There's still a lot of paper about, an estimated thousand billion sheets a year in America alone. And so many office activities remain largely unaffected by technology because they depend on people. Talking to colleagues, telephoning, reading and writing things, going to meetings, even thinking. Though not so obvious as it used to be, the traditional office hierarchy still exists. The conflict between the need to control what the staff do and the need to motivate them by allowing them freedom still remains. Perhaps all this high technology is really no closer to creating the perfect office than the scientific management techniques of the 1920s. I suspect the efficiency of an office is really more dependent on the personalities of the people who work there and how well they all get on with each other. Possibly just as important as all the technology is the annual attempt to foster better working relationships, the office party. Let your head explode. Brilliant. Ooh, gorgeous. Ooh, you tiger. Oh. <laughs> Have a savoury, Mr Jones. I won't be eating any of these. I'm allergic to pilchards. <laughs> a big one. Plutonia personnel want me, of course, heard of them? No. Ah, the innocence of fresh fish juice. You know what, Brian? You're pathetic. I won't bring a word in your ear. This is your last chance to pull my cracker before I move to pastures new. <laughs> I lie there thinking about pollution and global warming and dolphins and I can't get a wink of sleep, can you? Yeah, no bother. Just slip them off and I'll pop them on the radiator. Oh, are you sure? You and I, we know what we want and we go for it, eh? All right, big boy, come to my office in two minutes. I'll be ready. <laughs> I say, Jonesy, the boss wants you in our office pronto. Oh? Hell. Oh. Oh! Mr. Jones! Oh. What's happening? Oh, what did I do wrong? Bruce! You're safe with me, Brenda. Everyone must leave immediately. <laughs> I've got a solar panel in my flat. Do you want to see it? I've never knitted trousers before. That'll be quite a challenge. Oh, yes, Bruce, I will. Just name the day. Better buy the wife some flowers. Christmas! What a waste of resources!
this is the last episode we filmed. This was a very odd one. Um, as I researched the subject, uh, I kept finding that the, um, the building services, the actual technology in the building, uh, were less interesting than the social history of the office. Uh, so it developed into a more of a conventional documentary, really, uh, almost sort of fly on the wall footage of all the, the office workers doing things and that, that sort of style. Um, at the time it felt adventurous and uh, perhaps uh, opening my horizons to make more documentaries. Um, but I think in retrospect uh, I'm not so keen on it um, because I, I felt that the demonstrations that Rex and I did in the other films were kind of the heart of the series. They gave us the authority to talk about these machines. Uh, we're not experts, we've done this demonstration and this is what happens. Um, with a conventional documentary, I was really just relying on things I'd read and people I'd talked to. It wasn't so satisfying uh, as doing the demonstrations, I think. Having said that, I mean, it was fun uh, and I did enjoy it at the time. Uh, the end sequence was uh, quite epic um, when everything dances in uh, the festively decorated office. Um, I gathered all my friends together and they were all hiding under the desks. There were probably about 12 or 15 people uh, just pulling strings to make everything dance. Uh, but it was a fun bit of choreography, uh, getting that to work. Well, what's changed with offices? Um, well, hot desking is a, a new, a more recent phenomenon since we made the film. Um, and a general sort of depersonalising of your little cubicle in your space. Um, I think maybe this is deliberate to, to give the place more of a corporate thing to remove your uh, personal identity. Um, I would hate it. <laughs> uh, actually, I think the origins go back further. Uh, when my sister was a young architect, uh, her boss had designed a building with um, the window sills on the inside was sloping downwards at 45 degrees. And she said to him, uh, why don't you make them flat so people can put their possessions on them? And he said, that's why they're sloping, so they can't. <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, obviously, people just accept it. Uh, and then, sort of more recent phenomena of these uh, co-working spaces like WeWork, um, you have to sort of buy into their whole philosophy. Uh, I don't know. I'm too much of an individualist, I guess, to uh, be able to cope with that sort of thing. It really only just occurred to me that I think that uh, episode was a one-off. I wouldn't ever make any more documentaries like that. Um, I, I don't know where it comes from, but uh, right from when I was quite young, uh, when I left school, the, I didn't know what job I wanted to do. I knew the one thing I didn't want to do was to work in an office. I don't know where that came from, but it's something obviously that has been a sort of theme through my life. And then, because uh, I was thinking about it, I realised that an arcade machine I made a couple of years ago um, <laughs> returned to the same theme. Uh, this machine is called Trust Wildlife, and it's a little bird hide like you have on a nature reserve, uh, where there are two s seagulls uh, telling you all about the human race. Um, and they tell you all about office life. So, uh, as this is uh, the final programme in the series and the fi my final commentary, uh, I thought this was an appropriate uh, thing to leave you with. But only after a few hours, the restless creatures they are, they then leave again for the city. They then just get stuck in traffic jams. And because they're unable to fly, they're just stuck. Bonkers. Bonkers. The buildings in the city remain a great mystery. Inside, their nature cams reveal them gazing at screens in a trance or talking in a language that makes no sense at all. 
whatever they're up to, the great product, what comes out of the buildings at the end of each day, is bags of delicious food. Then it gets even better. The trucks collect the bags and unbelievably, they deliver it to our own feeding ground so we never need to go looking for it. They even spread out each load beautifully for us so it's nice for us to feast. Amazing! Now to end, we're delighted to have two specimens at very close quarters for you to examine. <laughs> Now don't stare, it's very important to be nice to them. It's only by protecting their species that we can ensure the magnificent rubbish will still be here for our future generations to admire and to enjoy.